worship this morning. It's good to see you here in God's house for worship. It's good to be with you wherever you are worshiping from this morning. Welcome to everyone. What a beautiful full morning we've been given today. Hopefully we appreciate it as it comes, certainly. We're glad that you're here. God is good, and God is calling God's people to worship. Just a few things. The elders will meet today after church, and this is a board meeting week, so that will happen this week on Wednesday at 7 o'clock via Zoom, so watch your email for that invitation, and uh, there will be some stuff coming in the mail with some upcoming events and some things happening around here, so just be sure that you stay alert and aware with our Facebook page and, and your snail mail and all of the things uh, that we use in today's world to communicate with you. So know that God is present and with us wherever we are. We turn our hearts toward God and worship. Everything in today's worship service ties together with our scripture from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, where the disciples are arguing amongst each other about who gets to be first and who gets to sit the closest to Jesus in the kingdom of God. Everything will tie to that scripture. And so I'm asking you to engage your minds for this 30 to 40 minutes as we think about that scripture and how uh, that's, God is using that scripture to lead us with what to do with our life of faith. And so I invite you now into a spirit of worship. Let us stand and call ourselves to worship as we stand and join in the call to worship that's printed on the screen, followed by our opening hymn, which fits right in with that scripture, Are Ye Able, said the Master. Let's stand together. Your way is just and true, O God, and your commandments are trustworthy. Your steadfast love is never far away from us, in the person of Jesus Christ. Because of knowing Christ, we will walk humbly, live justly, and worship you joyously, God of our lives. Amen. Thank you. 
So I'm asking you to remember the words that you just said. Okay? Keep those words in your mind as we go through these next few minutes together. Keep those words in your mind as we come together joining with one another in prayer. And our prayer time today is an opportunity for us to spend a little bit of time in prayer silently with God. I'm going to ask you to pray for a number of different things as we go along. And so rather than uh, simply allowing me to speak to God as a monologue between us, I want, I'm asking you as well to think about some things when I direct you and offer those prayers silently to God. So let us turn our thoughts and our attentions to God as we come to this time of prayer. God of infinite patience and unchanging wisdom, we come to you with so many things that claim our time, our energy, our resources, our very lives. Let us come before God, church, and silently think of some of those things and offer them to God, those things that claim our time, our energy, and our resources. God, we are so easily drawn away from serving you by the temptations and the responsibilities of the world to be first, to be comfortable, to not have to work for that which makes us better. God, let us lift to you silently those temptations that we face to gain recognition or prove success or be better than someone else or step out in front. Lord, we come to you today as people who are trying to do the best we can to work together and to be united in a world that continually pulls us apart. And so I ask that you hear us as we lift to you silently those people who frustrate us. Those people who do not live up to what we think they should be and do. And as we name those people who frustrate us, Lord, let us lift them and release them to you. Lord, you continue to offer us healing and hope. You desire for us a transformation in our lives from this selfish ambition to witness and service. We look at the world today in which there is so much anger and hatred and distrust, and we easily become overwhelmed by the needs and the stresses. And so today, I'm asking that we pray silently for those times that we feel frustrated by what is happening in the world around us. Lord, I pray that you help us to place our lives and our trust in you, knowing that with your help, many wonderful things can be accomplished which will provide hope and peace for others as well as ourselves. Let us pause and silently ask God to show us what we might accomplish, how we might live our lives for others.
Lord, we pray that you give us courage and strength to truly be your disciples. I ask that you hear us now as we come to you praying these prayers from our hearts and praying together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as we pray together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. So we have two weeks now. We finished the book of James. I'm going to do two weeks on the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. They're not, if you miss one, it's okay. It's not a series, but I'm going to do two. I'm going to do back-to-back -back scriptures. It was just simply too much, too big of a scripture to do that all in one sermon. So, uh, Or we could be here for a while. So I've, I've, I split that in part. So today, we're going to take a look at the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. 10 verses, verses 35 through 45. <clears throat> and it goes like this. Okay, so we are uh, 10 verse 35. Okay. So then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, two disciples of Jesus we know, came over and spoke to him, meaning Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. Now, I think that's pretty gutsy, first of all, to ask Jesus that in the first place. We want you to do us a favor. What is it, he asked. In your glorious kingdom, we want to sit in places of honor right next to you. They said, one at your right and the other one at your left. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of sorrow that I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering that I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they said, we are able. Didn't you just sing those words? Oh, oh yep, we can do that. Not even a second thought. We'll be right there. And Jesus said, you will indeed drink from my cup and be baptized with my baptism. But I have no right to say who will sit on the thrones next to mine. God has prepared those places for the ones that God has chosen. <laughs> when the ten others discovered what James and John had asked, they were indignant, made them mad, ticked them off. So Jesus called them all together. And he said, you know that in this world, kings and tyrants and officials lord it over the people and beneath the people beneath them. But among you, it should be quite different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first must be the slave of all. For even I, the Son of Man came here not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. So we're going to look at this scripture lesson, probably going to look, look at it uh, verse by verse. Wendy, if you want to back it up, you're certainly welcome to do that. We're going to take a look at this scripture and pick it apart and hopefully not make us feel too awful in the process. <laughs> so did your kids ever play the, the, the shotgun game when you were going somewhere in the car and whoever yelled shotgun first got to ride in the front seat? Yeah, you know shotgun? And then the other one was relegated to the back? My kids used to play that and I'm, not, I'm, confessing, I'm confessing a parental flaw right here. Because they used to play that, and I'm telling you what, they got into some real literal knockdown, drag out fights about this. The end result was usually the big brother 
knocking the little sister out of the way, and then she would cry and pout all the way to wherever it was we were going. I could bank on them. I hope I'm not the worst parent in the world. Isn't it funny how you can look back and see all your parenting flaws? <laughs> At any rate, so today's story has the disciples playing this game of shotgun, basically. Playing shotgun, the game played out pretty much the same way as it did with my own kids. So right off the bat, we know that James and John, or we can assume that James and John have been muttering to themselves. And they've been talking to themselves like, all right, this is what we want. We're just going to go for it. We're just going to go ask. Okay, what's the worst that can happen? We're just going to go ask. So in verse 35, they came over to him, worked up the courage that it took to go over to him and go, hey, can you do me a favor? We want you to do us a favor. So right out of the gate. Now, before we get to, um, you know, shaking our heads at that, let's look at our, our life. Because I feel like sometimes we do this too. Because I feel like sometimes we do this with our prayer life. Most generally, the prayers that we offer to God begin with uh, some kind of word that demands. Kind of like the disciples. Do. We want you to do us a favor. That's like us, okay? We want you to heal this person, or take away that, or give me this, or do this for me. We use command words when we're talking to God, don't we? Get me through this. Give, get this job for me. Take this cancer away. Make the rain stop. That's what I've been doing. Make the, get me through this. Whatever. Motivate my child. We use these command words when we're talking to God. Do whatever it is that we ask. It's just like that. So right away, you and I are in this story. Verse 37 says, we want to sit in places of honor next to you. Give us the best seats in the house, right next to you. Now, it's not that big a surprise that these two should ask such a thing. You know, if you study scripture before, when he calls James and John the sons of Zebedee, he gives them a nickname called the sons of thunder. And they're called the sons of thunder for a reason. Most likely because of their boisterous and impetuous behavior. <laughs> but because we have served you faithfully, we should get special treatment. Now, the text isn't really clear to us whether this means in eternity or whether this means in Christ's kingdom here on earth, which they thought was at hand. It doesn't really matter. What matters is, does the verse resonate resonate? God, I have been a faithful member of this church all my life. I have followed you faithfully from day one. I have tried my whole life to be a good person. I should get something for that. That should count for something. I'd like to be right up there with you. Oh, my, are we in this scripture. And then Jesus says to the disciples in 38, you, you don't have a clue what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the bitter cup of sorrow that I'm going to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering that I am baptized with? Now, you and I know because we sit on this side of scripture, you and I know what the disciples don't know. You and I know what they are asking. That the road that Jesus is walking is a road that leads 
to a torturous crucifixion. A death on a cross, the, the cup that Jesus is to drink is, is the cup of his horrible death. The baptism is, 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 is his death that he will die on, on a cross. We know that. The disciples have no idea what they're asking. So right away they're like, yep, yep, we can, sure can. Are you able, said the master, to be crucified with me? Fred even put drums in it and so we could go, Lord, we are able, our spirits are thine. Are they? <laughs> Are they? Hmm. Yea, the sturdy dreamers answered to the death. We follow thee. Lord, we are able. We just sang that. We just sang it. But are we really? Are we willing and able to do what Christ asks us to do? We are those sturdy dreamers. Are we able to receive the peace, the benefits, the joy, the sense of deeper meaning, whatever it is that Jesus is about to give us this week? Are we able to respond in kind? Sure we are, we answer. We have no idea what this week might hold for us, do we? We have no idea how our beliefs might be challenged this week. Are we able? And then verse 41, the others got mad that these two would even ask such a thing. So there's this little childish jealousy thing going on now between the others. These two got up the courage to do it. The others now are mad. The text in many translations uses the word indignant, which means madder than a hornet. Jealousy is an ugly thing, isn't it? Oof. Jealousy among the disciples over this? Can you even imagine? Can we relate? Just asking. And then in 42 through 44, and I think at this point Jesus must be like this. You know you've seen those memes come around Facebook where Jesus is like this. <laughs> I feel like that's where he is right now in these verses 42 through 44. So we call them all together. All right, class. Let's get this out there once and for all. You know in this world there are kings and tyrants who lord it over the people underneath them. Don't we know that? We know that. But among you it should be different. Among you it should be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. Now, I don't want you to feel too awful because this is the third time that Jesus has been over his, his disciples in the Gospel of Mark. This is the third time we've been, and I want him to say, we've been over this and over this and over this. And still, the first shall be last. Whoever wants to be great must be a servant. Mark wants to make it clear to the disciples and to us that following Jesus means a life of sacrifice and servanthood. Living a life as a Christian turns the world's values on its head. So that's what I want you to get out of this. Following Jesus does not mean that we get what we want from God. Following Jesus is God's way of getting what God wants out of us. God wants the world restored to God. And the way God gets that is with ordinary people like you and like me who are willing to walk like Jesus and talk like Jesus and even if need be, to suffer like Jesus. Three times Jesus tried to define what it means to be first. And then in the very last verse of this scripture, he says, For even I, the Son of Man, of all people, I think he wants to say, even I came not to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom for many. 
Bob Dylan was right, I think, in that lyric that he wrote, you gotta have to serve somebody. You're gonna have to serve somebody. When Jesus gives his life as a ransom, he frees us not to become what the world understands as great, but to serve others as slaves of Christ. And that's really great news for us. It's what we're about. It's what we do. I have a friend who left the congregational side of ministry to become a church consultant hired by churches to help them grow. And he said, first, find where people itch. And then find a way for the church to scratch that itch. The church exists to meet people's needs, he said. If we truly sat at Jesus' side, if we truly drank the cup that he drank, lived the life that he lived, what a difference that would make. It would, however, make our lives much more difficult. We live in this world, in this world, that says, look out for yourself. Don't let anyone tell you what you can and can't do. There's not time in this world to invest in others, to be a servant, to put someone else before yourself. We have enough stuff to do on our own. Those are the messages we get in today's world, and we get them from all sides. But that's not how this life of faith works, is it? If we're going to take this scripture seriously today, we take a look and we examine our lives and what we do for others. Where did you fit in the story? Let's examine our lives and what we do for others. The greatest person in God's sight who is a person who has a heart of humble service towards God and others. So after all that, however many minutes that was of rambling, I can sum it up in one sentence. You should write this down maybe. Our goal in life should be bringing out the best in others. Sermon in a sentence, our goal in life should be bringing out the best in others. Let's pray about that. Lord, we're thankful, I guess, that you've put this scripture in front of us. We find ourselves in it, maybe in a place we don't want to be, arguing, squabbling, trying to claw our way to the top. Lord, help us to remember that our life in this world as Christians is a life of service to others, first and foremost, and that our goal in life should be bringing out the best in others. And I just pray, oh God, that you will help us to do that in those we meet this week and in those we meet in our lives and in our world. Pray in your name. Amen. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I find myself in those passages of Scripture <laughs> all the time. And I am so thankful that I am in a congregation or in a church structure that believes in coming around the table every time we gather. Now today, I have to take a little bit of a sidestep and tell you that we are having spiritual communion today because as Christians, we live in the world. And now, living in the world, our delivery of our communion has been delayed. So the shipment is somewhere out there in wherever. So I want you to just have spiritual communion today in your mind, imagining, unless you brought it with you, gold stars, right? Unless you brought it with you, but imagine uh, those elements that are in front of you. And so we get a chance to come to this table every time we gather together and say, man, Lord, give me one more chance. I'm going to try again this week. <laughs> let's, let's try again. And that chance comes again and again and again. So as we worship, we take a seat at the table. 
today in particular as people who come looking for another chance. We come remembering Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. And we think about the symbols, the broken body and the shed blood. And we gain the strength to live as God has called us to be. So I invite you to uh, come around this table, be in an attitude and a spirit of communion as we sing our song, Make Me a Servant. where we unite as one to remember what Christ has done for us. All are welcome to join us at this communion table because this is the Lord's table and this is here and you are here at his invitation. Let us pray. Today we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ to share this meal as we remember the extraordinary sacrifice made in sending your beloved son Jesus to be with us. Lord, we come to you to know uh, now to ask for forgiveness for any thoughts, words, or deeds that have not honored your name. Help us to use those thoughts. Help us to use this gift worthily, worthily to confess and forsake our sins, to confidently believe that we are forgiven through Christ Jesus, and to grow in faith as love day by day until we come at the last to the joy of the eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. May the Lord uh, bless our servanthood. May this bread nourish our souls and provide us strength. May this cup quench our thirst for you and for the love so generously given to us. We thank you, Lord, for your grace that is at work in our lives. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the loaf of bread, and when he had I have given thanks. He broke it, and he said to his disciples, This is my body broken for you. Do this, in, uh, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup, and he blessed it. And he said, This is my new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Let us share the meal of the Lord together. Thank you.
As always, it's good to be in God's house to worship together and to be together in wherever you are as we worship today. It was good to be in God's house. I invite you, as we have done from the beginning of all of this, if you'd like to stay and pray for specific people in your lives, we will take opportunity to do that in just a few minutes. Um, but for now, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, King of Kings, followed by our benediction. Let's stand together. Thank you. 